Ladies and gentlemen, here is your host, Walt Disney. Thank you, Garko. In this exciting age when everyone seems to be talking about the future possibilities of space travel, there's much speculation on what we will discover when we visit other worlds. Will we find planets with only a low form of vegetable life? Or will there be mechanical robots controlled by super intelligent beings? One of the most fascinating fields of modern science deals with the possibility of life on other planets. This is our story. In the beginning, man's world was his cave. His only concern was for food and companionship. With the sun came the day, bringing warmth and light. With the stars came the night, bringing darkness and fear. Later, when man became a shepherd, he spent more time contemplating the mystery of the stars. Because they moved, he believed them to be living things, possibly the children of the moon breaking away when the moon grew smaller. Then he noticed the reappearance of star formations he had seen before. Where had they come from, and where were they going? An important discovery. The stars fell into the sea. Man's conception of his world had expanded. The Earth was an island floating in water, circled by a glittering ring of heavenly objects. As man learned to till the soil, he associated the stars with events of good and evil. When the bull was in the heavens, he planted his crops. This was good. Aquarius, the water carrier, brought the rains. This was also good. With the virgin of the harvest, the crops were gathered. This was very good. But Draco the dragon brought pestilence and famine. This was evil. Then man began to build cities with towers to bring him closer to the heavens. Man became an astronomer. He sought a more logical explanation for the earth and the heavens above. The earth, he thought, must be flat with its roots deep in celestial waters. In time, he changed the roots to stone pillars to afford easier passage for the stars in their nightly journey. Later, elephants were substituted because of their great strength. To support the elephants, he added a gigantic tortoise who pulled the universe through cosmic waters with infinite slowness. The Egyptians, who loved to draw, represented Earth as a reclining figure with a star-filled sky bending over the top. Shu, the god of air, kept them apart, while the sun and the moon sailed back and forth in a small boat. The Greeks were among the first learned men of astronomy. These great philosophers gave the world many profound conceptions of Earth and space. Plato said, I have found the Earth to be the perfect shape of a cube standing in the center of the universe with all other heavenly bodies scattered round and about. Anaxagoras had this to say. Being in the center of the universe, the Earth is assailed by the rotating ether, which tears away bits of Earth, flinging them outward, setting them afire, creating stars and planets. Then there was Aristarchus. Uh, gentlemen, I disagree. The sun is obviously in the center, with the Earth and other planets traveling in circular paths. And thus, the sun in Finally, there was Ptolemy. Learned men of science, I have listened to all your arguments. I now decree that our great Earth stands immovable as the hub of the universe, the supreme center of intelligent thinking. <laughs> Thus, Ptolemy's decree was blindly accepted as the law of science for over a thousand years. Free and logical thought was stifled by a blank period of stupidity, superstition, and sorcery. With the Renaissance came a learned Nicholas Copernicus. He proved mathematically that the Earth was not the center of the universe, but was merely one of many planets circling the glowing sun. In 1610, Galileo published his Sidereus Nuncius, 
in which he vividly described the wonders of the heavens as seen through that great new invention, the telescope. The planets were not spots of light, but were spheres like the Earth. Jupiter had belts of color. Venus had phases like the moon. Saturn had a gorgeous ring. And Mars was round and red.